we're talking about bad proof texts. I'm going to start with some Old Testament examples, but first, when somebody quotes you out of context and distorts your meaning, how do you feel? I've been quoted out of context a number of times, um, sometimes by scholars, sometimes by journalists, although I appreciate the mention. Uh, but sometimes, occasionally, it's been such that the meaning sounds almost exactly the opposite of what I intended, and I find it very embarrassing. What do you do when somebody quotes you out of context? Do you sue them? And yet, very often, we quote the Bible out of context. Is God going to sue us? I'll give you an example from Psalm 50, verse 10, where it says, The cattle on a thousand hills belong to God. Every animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. Well, does that mean that God has lots of cows, and he'll, he has some to spare, so he'll give us some, and, you know, since we don't really need any cows, many of us will just sell them off, get the cash, and buy what we want? Maybe we should examine the context first. The context of Psalm 50 is a covenant lawsuit where God is suing his people. It says, he summons the heavens above and the earth, that he may judge his people. Well, back in Deuteronomy, God said that uh, they were the witnesses of the covenant, the heavens and the earth. So he's summoning them to a legal situation. Gather to me my consecrated ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens proclaim God's righteousness, for God is judge. Hear my people, and I will testify against you. Oh, now, we're, now they're in trouble. God is the judge, and God is also going to testify as a witness. And then God tells them what he's not prosecuting them for. He says, I don't reprove you for your sacrifices and your offerings because, quite frankly, Israel, I don't actually need them. Many people in the ancient Near East thought that gods depended on, on the people's sacrifices or the gods would become weak from not eating enough. Well, God says, if I were hungry, if I really were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. The world is mine and all that's in it. The, the point he's making is not hey, I have some extra cows. Here, take some. The point that he's making is don't think that your sacrifices make you right with me. Look, I don't need your cows. They all belong to me anyway. If I wanted one, I would just take it. Now, that doesn't mean God won't provide for our needs. It does mean that that's not a verse to use to support it. Another verse that sometimes gets quoted out of context, some of, some of us sing that song, This is the Day that the Lord Has Made. I won't try to sing it for you because I don't want um, word to get around among thousands of people who watch this video how badly Craig Keener sings. But in any case, Psalm 118, verse 24, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's start a few verses back in verse 22 of Psalm 118. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So he's probably not saying this is the day the Lord has made every other Tuesday or every, every Wednesday the Lord has made or every day the Lord has made we should rejoice in it. I mean, the Bible does say rejoice in the Lord always. But that's not probably the point of this text. The point of this text is more phenomenal than that. It's referring to the special day that the stone was rejected by the builders and God made it the chief cornerstone. And of course we know the application of that principle in the New Testament that this is a celebration of the victory that God has brought about for us in Christ. I, I don't know if you ever sing about the lily of the valley or the rose of Sharon. Well, that's appropriate as long as we don't read that back into the biblical text. Because, yeah, Jesus, Jesus is, is beautiful, the fairest among 10,000, yes. But what do those lines actually mean in the Song of Solomon? Well, in Song of Solomon 1-2, when he talks about the, the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valleys, uh, Look, look in, uh, uh, sorry, 2-1, in, in the very next verse, like a lily among thorns, so is my darling among the maidens. He's not talking about Jesus. He's not even talking about Solomon's, uh, Solomon himself. He's talking about Solomon's bride. Uh, and this, this fits the romance genre. Um, again, we, we love Jesus. We can be romantic with Jesus, so sometimes we can use the language that way, but that's not what this originally means. Um, it's ancient romance language. I mean, today we might light candles, uh, might go out for dinner or something like that. Uh, but romance was handled a different way in ancient literature. Spring has come. The voice of the turtle dove is heard in the land. 
uh, fertility, apples, raisins, and so on. That was, that was romantic language back then. His banner over me is love. He brought me to his banqueting table. Um, since I don't know who's watching this, I probably shouldn't even go into those details. You look like one of Pharaoh's horses. Well, normally today, I mean, I, I wouldn't probably say that to my wife as an expression of her beauty. It might even get me in trouble if I tried to say that to my wife. And my wife is very beautiful, uh, but let me not be distracted. Uh, but, but, but you look like one of Pharaoh's horses in Song of Solomon. I mean, it may simply be saying Pharaoh's horses were beautiful and you're beautiful. Uh, some, some scholars have also suggested that it was a military strategy that when the Hittites were attacking, the Egyptians would loose a, a mare uh, that would distract all the Hittite stallions from their uh, war-based thing that they were doing. Now, if that's the case, what he's saying is, my love, you are so beautiful that you just utterly distract me from everything else. In any case, you get the idea. Joel chapter 2 and verse 9, there's a song about this. They rush on the city. They run in the wall. They climb into the houses. They enter the windows through th like, like a thief. Uh, rush on the city. Run in the wall. The army that carries out God's word. Is, who is this invading army? Is it us? Well, actually, in context, it's talking about an invading army of a locust plague. And it's talking about judgment. So this is a text about judgment. Joel chapter 3 and verse 10. Uh, we often sing that song about, let the weak say, I am strong. Uh, hopefully, despite my being off key, you can understand uh, what the song is. Well, it's a great song, and it's true theologically. His power is perfected in weakness. We have that in the New Testament as well. However, uh, the particular wording comes from a translation of Joel chapter 3 and verse 10. Let the weak say, I am strong. Let the weak say, I am someone mighty. Well, the context of that is that God is gathering the nations to judgment. And he says, okay, you want to you fight against Israel? You want to fight against my people? Okay, proclaim this among the nations. Prepare a war. Beat your plowshares into swords. Let the weak say, I am strong. I'm going to wipe you out. My, my encouragement to you is that if God is using you to write songs, please look the verses up in context before you write the songs. I'm going to give some examples in the next lesson from the New Testament of some bad proof texts.